Hello, people. Welcome to another podcast episode. Today we're sitting down with my friend Brad. I've known Brad for many years. We go way back. And Brad is also into long-term travel. He uh, studied abroad in Italy. He lived in Thailand. He came to visit me in Japan. Uh, He's taken a round-the-world trip. So he's got a lot of experience and a lot of good insights on traveling. Um, Yeah, today we just talk about how travel is a lot cheaper than you think it is. How the world is a lot safer than you think it is. How long-term travel is actually a lot easier than you think it is. So if you're at all interested in long-term travel, if you like any of my videos, if any of it has piqued your curiosity, give it a listen. I think you're really going to find some valuable stuff in this one. And guys, this is a real podcast episode. We sat down with a guest over Zoom and had a discussion. It was a real podcast. So please enjoy this episode. Um, If you like what I'm doing, if you want to support me, hop on over to the Patreon. $3 a month for early access to these podcasts and exclusive content, lots of other stuff. So if you like what I'm doing, go check that out. All right, guys. Enjoy. Well, dude, I haven't seen you in so long, man. How you doing? Been good, man. Just been out here in Colorado. It's been, jeez, uh, how long has it been since I moved here? Maybe like a year and a half now. Yeah, it was like right after uh, um, Halloween for COVID, okay. so like 2020. So, yeah, nice. it's been fun out here. Yeah, I think the last time I saw you, we were getting beers in Atlanta, like after I just moved back from Japan. Is that right? Oh, uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, you'd hit me up. You're like, yo, I'm back in town because, you know, you were there a lot longer than I was. So, yeah. yeah. Damn. So that must have been probably like two years ago. At least. Yeah, dude. God damn. It's good to see you, man. Yeah, good to see you too. So why did you, um, so I kind of want to like get into your story and all that shit, like how you started traveling and like, obviously you came to visit me in Japan and, uh, yeah. So like you, you grew up traveling right like your parents were always going on cruises and shit and like skiing and right yeah so we did one ski trip which was like an absolute disaster because you know when you're like 10 years old you don't want to put on the equipment and it's wet and you've got to like lug all the gear so we did one ski trip that was a disaster so after that (laughs) we put that to rest and then yeah we moved on to the cruises and what my family does like instead of going um and like getting a bunch of like christmas gifts and stuff like that there would always be like a note on the Christmas tree. Be like, hey, like I got us tickets to whatever cruise and we're going to go to like Cozumel, Jamaica and, you know, like yada, yada, yada. And um, yeah, we always just did that for Christmas. So like growing up on a few cruises, I say like three or four. And then like as we got older and, you know, they could take us like further away and we could do better, you know, vacations as we got older, um, those started to happen. But um now, honestly, like kind of phased out of some of the cruises, you know, because it's really limited with traveling. You really just see the coast and then it's more so of like all of the cruise lines like own the places you go to. So it's not really traveling. Yeah, dude. No, I like I mean, I guess you've been on a lot of cruises. I've only been on one, but I went on like a Disney cruise and like they just dropped us off at some island in like the Bahamas. But yeah, it felt very like catered to tourists like guys trying to sell you beads and shit for like $15 and yeah, it just doesn't feel real. You know what yeah. I mean? And then you're in port for like 10 hours. So you're up at like seven in the morning and then you're like shuffling around, like trying to find like your itinerary and like what you're going to do within 10 hours. So you can't even go that far and then you can't miss the boat. Right. Or else that's a pain <laughs> in the ass and you got to fly somewhere and it's just a yeah, headache. Man. So, Oh man, if you do like a cruise, you got to do, I think one of the big ones that do it right. But, like, some of the carnivals, and especially now after, like, COVID and everything, you know, they've got to be such a, a less desirable trip to take, I would think. Yeah, you're just, like, so close to people, and I don't know, dude, to me, it's just, it's so, like, everything is so controlled, you know what I mean? It's like being at a theme park where, like, it's kind of hard to have, like, a unique experience. It's very, like, tailored to just, like, your average American type shit. Oh, yeah. Everyone does the same shit, like... <laughs> Oh, uh, zip lining or, hey, we'll take like a catamaran for the day. Or we'll go get day drunk and like come back. And 
right. it's really lots it. of drinking really not much more yeah <laughs> what, what's another one uh cayman islands go to pet the stingrays you know a lot of people want to go down there to like kiss them for like seven years good luck whatever the locals <laughs> were telling people to like get money out of your pocket to come swim with the stingrays you know it sounds like some chinese like fucking prophecy like uh what is it the rhino horn you know what i'm talking about oh yeah is that what they put in the <laughs> soup no, I think that's uh, maybe, but I I know shark. Oh, fin never mind. Soup, I'm thinking of shark think. fin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you had that? No. Uh. Uh-uh. I'm uh, sure it's hard to come by, and I might get arrested, right? If you try it, <laughs> I'm sure it's like whatever the exchange rate is there, but probably nah, like dude. a pretty penny for you to get a bowl of that. Nah, bro. Just go to go to a wet market in China. You're straight. <laughs> oh, jeez, man. You can try the penguin, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, fuck God, that. Damn. Well, anyways, yeah, so you started doing cruises, and then, like, when did you, like, age out of those? Like, when did you guys stop doing those? Oh, man. I don't know, maybe, like, high school? I'm trying to think. We weren't much of a beach family, either. Yeah. Um, but you were, like, it was, like, before you were, like, a grown-ass man, basically. You are still, like, a kid going on these cruises. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, kind of separation, you know, you have your group of friends in high school and they go to college and then, you know, you Mm want to do bigger and better things. So, um, which that like really got me interested in like wanting to study abroad. So that's like, you know, the first thing on my list when I came to college is like, okay, I got to find a program here and like what countries am I interested in? I can knock out some college credits or, you know, take like a bullshit course just to get over there. Um, Yeah. And then that started my interest in like the bigger stuff and you know, world's a big place. So there's a lot of like desirable countries to go to. Where did you study abroad? It was in Italy. And then I did a weekend in Switzerland while I was there. And so Italy is beautiful. Yeah. I spent like five, six weeks there for study abroad. Yeah. God damn. That's sick, dude. Yeah. I was creeping on your Instagram the other day. Um, and yeah, it looked like you had a goddamn adventure, man. I think you like had a GoPro then you're like skydiving and bungee jumping and like all kinds of fun shit. Oh yeah. That's when they were super popular. I think they came out with like hero three at the time, but that was when like GoPro was like, you know, they were coming out with like the sickest videos. So I hopped on that and I bought that. I'm like, dude, I got to like film everything. And, um, yeah, I felt like, uh, the program we had was like pretty cool. So Monday and Wednesday we were in a new town that we took a charter bus to in Italy and then like Tuesday and Thursday, we were like actually like in the class. And then we had weekends free because I know some other people's programs were like they had to like spend their weekends like with the chaperones and like the professors. I'm like, that sounds yeah, miserable. Fuck that. fuck that. Yeah. There's like no freedom. And oh, man. And then you don't get Wait, to do so all guys, the stuff college kids want to do. You know, did you guys hop around? You're saying you like went to different towns each week and then studied two days there and you left? Yeah. So, like, I stayed in Tuscany in a small town called Monte Pluciano. We called it Monte P. Uh, beautiful Monty town. P. <laughs> yeah. For the people who couldn't pronounce it, they're like, you know, fuck this, we're going to shorten it. But, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so many places you can get to within, like, I would say, like, a four-hour bus ride. So, like, we'd have to be up at, like, six in the morning, and I think Rome was probably about three to four hours from where we were uh, living for those five mm-hmm. weeks. Um, so you do that, spend a day trip, you know, uh, go see you at Spanish steps, like the Coliseum and all that good stuff, you know, the, the David and Florence, um, and then you come back and then you got, uh, which was nice. Our class ended on Thursday. So we had Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And you just had to make it back Monday before class started and you were good. So you could really like roll in the class <laughs> if you didn't have an early one, like Monday morning, like fresh off your weekend trip. So right. that was pretty cool. Reeking of limoncello. Oh man, dude, that shit gave me the worst hangovers. It's all sugar, sugar, alcohol, and lemons. Like that is it, dude. The Italians know how to do alcohol and sweets, man. Like those little, uh, what are those little cookies called? Like macaroons or whatever. Is that Italian? Oh, that might be French. I'm not sure oh, though. Huh. I ate a lot of those in Italy. I just remember that. Oh yeah. I don't think I've ever oh, had man. one. Are they worth? Oh it? yeah, they're solid. They're solid. They're expensive. They're very expensive, but eh, try it once. Okay. I yeah. got a sweet tooth, so that sounds good. I know the Greek, uh, the Greeks have a uh, baklava. Have you ever had that? Isn't it like a pastry or something? Like, real flaky? Yeah, it's like a layered pastry, but it's pretty good, and there's like all different flavors for it, too. Nice. And isn't your family Greek? 
Or are they Italian? My dad's Italian. And then my mom is, whatever she is, a blend of like, maybe like Polish and German. I'm not exactly sure, to be honest. But my dad's definitely the Italian, the family. Gotcha. Yeah. Tarantino. So Tarantino is actually, uh, there's a little town on the heel. You know how Italy shaped like a boot? Yeah. On the heel of the boot called Taranto. And Tarantino is of Taranto. It's kind of like mm. the Americanized name whenever they came over, you know, however long ago that was. Nice. Cool. So did that influence your decision to go to Italy? You're like, oh, I got to go back to my homeland, see where I'm from. <laughs> yeah, maybe a little bit. Yeah. And I think Italy is just a hot place for everybody. Um, you know, when you kind of look at the logistics, there's so much you can see in such a tightly packed area. And that's what I think makes it desirable, too. And then just like all the culture there, too. Um, you know, Sistine Chapel. Yeah, I mean, I spent... Yes, I did something... Uh, I was in like three different towns every single week for the five weeks I was there and I still didn't see all of uh, Italy. Like I didn't get to go to Positano, which would have gone there. Um, What's that? Positano is like, oh man, it's like a coastal town. If I showed you pictures, you'd be like, oh yeah, like all the Instagram like influencers like come here and like take a bunch of pictures and stuff like that. It's on the Amalfi Coast or by it, which is on the western side of Italy. Um, oh, right. which is where all the, um, you know, worthwhile towns are to go to is on the, is on the West side. But, um, yeah, I mean, there's just so many places to go to. Yeah. And I mean, you can't really see an entire country in five weeks. Like that would be fucking exhausting, you know? Yeah. Like imagine seeing yeah, like, moving around of, like, Canada in like six weeks. That'd be goddamn impossible <laughs> oh man yeah you would spend yeah. your time in a bus the, the entire time just looking out yeah, the window dude. like ah, oh, okay i've been there check you know <laughs> drop the pin yeah yeah so was your time studying at rob was that like the first time you were kind of like on your own like making your own choices and like deciding what trips to go on and like who to hang out with and stuff like that yeah yeah, which really, you know, gave me the confidence to, yeah, I'm sure we'll get to this, but like going to Thailand by myself. But yeah, because, you know, parents are like, look, if you're interested, like, you know, fucking it's on you. Like, figure out who you need to talk to, figure out a plan, figure out a budget, you know, all this other stuff, especially with your major too. Um, one of the downfalls to my major being, uh, I was a mechanical engineering major, is there's like no study abroad programs for like engineers at least not at the school I went to um so I ended up taking I got a lit class that I had to take that worked out and then I ended up taking one or two other classes just to go they had nothing to do so they were like extra hours like whatever just get me there if I've got to take classes they're all bullshit anyway people get an A um so, Wait, so like, why yeah, did you even like want to study then like why wouldn't you just like go and not even worry about class then Oh, man. Well, I still didn't want to get like an F, right? Like you really have to try hard to like flunk out of a study abroad class. We mean like you got to show up and just like turn in shit, even if it's like incompetent work and it has no (laughs) bearing on like, you know, it's just like you kind of just fake it till you make it, turn something in, you get A or B, and then you got to go to Italy. That's pretty much it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I more so meant like, why did you want to study abroad? Like, why wouldn't you just like go... I don't know, with a tour group and not, like, take a class if you were, like, searching for extra credits, you know what I mean? What do you mean? Like, uh, like outside of school? Why wouldn't I yeah, just yeah. do it yeah. by myself? Oh, well, yeah. shit, the parents are floating the bill, to be honest. So, I was like, hey, <laughs> like, you know, it's a lot more appealing if I take their money and do it for school than if I take their money and be like, hey, like, I'm going to go get fucked up with the Italians and, like... <laughs> See you in two weeks. If I need money, I'll text you. So it's a little bit more appealing to have it integrated with school. Uh, right, right. It's like a professional development. Like, I'm um, building my resume, mom and dad. <laughs> yeah, your boy's becoming a man, and he needs to go to Italy to discover himself. So <laughs> it's, a rite, it's a rite of passage, you know? Yeah, right? Yeah, it's, like you said, it's, it's uh, the home country, too. So yeah, that's going to add to it. Did you go see where your, where your family was from? No, uh uh-uh. So I didn't get to go another place was Sicily. I didn't make my way that far south of Italy. Um, No, yeah. Didn't get to go to Sicily. 
then go to Toronto, because that's so far out of the way, too. That's as far south as you can get and as far east as you can get. Yeah, and since we're on the west side. There. Yeah. Yeah, and I, was, I wasn't as interested. I mean, um, I was more interested going to Switzerland, which is where I did that bungee jumping. Um, that was at the top of my list. And I actually think I saw a video on GoPro. And I was like, oh, fuck. Like, I was doing some research. I was like, oh, this is in Switzerland? Like, oh, I can get there with, like, a 10-hour bus ride? Like, that's pretty close. Like, I'm not going to come halfway around the world and not go an extra 10 hours. I mean, that sounds <laughs> absurd. So we found a, uh, a place, a business that catered to college students called Bus to Alps. And they had, like, a little weekend trip. And they'd, you know, come out of Rome or something like that. So, um, so that was nice. great. So they, like, you pay them, like, 200 euros everything's catered for they like book your hostel and then uh yeah you get to spend the weekend in, like a different country so yeah i'd recommend anyone's listening is interested in that yeah bust the alps if you're ever in europe yeah do that it's a quick little uh two three day weekend vacation you can take while you're on study abroad nice yeah it's probably a really nice bus ride too you like can probably see like how the landscape changes and whatnot oh yeah yeah especially going through switzerland the tunnels are like long so you got to cut through the Swiss Alps, uh, but Ooh. beautiful scenery. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, I, sometimes I really prefer, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, but like sometimes I really prefer like taking a bus or a car or a motorcycle as opposed to flying, like, especially for something that's like that medium distance, like 10 hours. If you can like spend a little extra time, like you can really see like for yourself, um, like how the landscape changes very slowly as opposed to like. You know, you get on a fucking plane, a jet, and you just, like, step into a capsule, and then, like, you just appear in a new place when you walk out. So, yeah. like, I feel like in a car, I don't know, you can just really see and, like, appreciate that change in landscape a little more. Yeah, and you don't have to put up with the headache of, like, TSA and, like, oh, fuck, is my bag overweight? Or, like, oh, I didn't know I had my, like, fucking, like, hair scissors or yeah. something like that so just any of those like little like headaches like the airport usually offers you you know how to oh put up God. with that oh yeah. it's the worst dude bro i thought you know traveling internationally i found that like america is like the hardest fucking country to fly in because like we have tsa and like drug dogs and people are patting you down and like scanning your body dude i don't know if you yeah you flew out of japan but when i flew out of japan it was fucking easy dude you just like walk through a metal detector and like you're good. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. yeah, I guess it depends on the country, too, right? Like, when you tell me it's, like, Japan has, like, a 98% conviction rate or yeah, something like crazy. crazy. Like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, a.k.a. don't break the fucking law or else <laughs> <laughs> you're going to jail. There's no, like, due process. You're just, you're yeah. basically guilty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jeez. So, that's, all right, cool. So, you fucking uh, studied abroad in Italy and then what were you like a junior then yeah that was my college? junior year and then you graduated and then you left for thailand like right away or like what was that like that process yeah it was a plan so i took a semester off and worked so i had to saved up some money and it's like any job you get bored so i'm like fuck like what am i doing it's like so i'm like on the clock like planning my trip hey. which made me feel <laughs> a little bit guilty i was like whatever my, my boss was cool he didn't give a shit and i got my work done um so yeah, I'm like, look, like, how do I plan this? And then of course, like, I want to do it as cheaply as possible. So like, literally, oh man, I want to say it was like two days after I graduated. So I'm like still hung over from like graduating college and like partying, um, hopped on this plane, but, um, oh man. So I'm like a Excel guy. I'm not sure if I ever sent you that, but there were a couple of people who have asked me for my Excel file on Thailand and I had everything like to the penny like laid out like how much is my gopro gonna cost like even like the water housing and like okay what's like the average price per food um you know yeah, what's you the average flight yeah because i was yeah, I like went, oh, fuck. i used that before i went oh hell yeah yeah, yeah if you break <laughs> it down because like little things like you know if you need vaccinations like this was completely unnecessary but i got like malaria medication i was like okay if i'm gonna do it i'm gonna do it right and i don't really know and like the medication was like 50 bucks. So I was like, whatever. Um, what else did I get? Typhoid. Um, yeah. So yeah. like little things like that, like go onto the CDC website, like also figure out like which areas are bad to stay away from. 
Um, yeah, that's smart, man. That's like good research yeah. to do. Like find out where not to go. Yeah. Well, cause I knew it was like, you know, same thing with like the study abroad trip. Like, Hey, like, you know, for that, my parents were floating the bill. So it's like, Hey, like have some credible information to not freak them out. So, you know, how like parents are, especially moms, like, I'm like, yeah. Hey, like I'm going by myself. And then I'm sure you've gotten this too. But the biggest criticism is like, Oh, you don't speak the language. Like what's going to happen. I'm like, look, if you speak English, <laughs> you're good. Even yeah. like in Japan, right? Like all of the signs in Thailand's like that too. There's a derivation of English from the, you know, the national uh, language. So it's like, yeah. it's not that hard. Yeah, Especially some fucking uh, countries that signals. do tourists. Yeah. No, I was on this uh, Facebook page. It's like called Solo Travelers, I think. And some guy was like selling a shirt and it had like a car and like a ship and like a beer and like it just had like all the essential stuff on like this grid on his shirt and he would just like point to shit <laughs> oh shit <laughs> that's awesome yeah yeah if you don't know the language it works <laughs> yeah you need like a handful of like terms too i mean like thank you like learn cheers right like you can get mm. just smile and have a beer in your hand and buy somebody a beer even if you get a mumble shit or like Google translate, there's a, there's ways around pretty much everything now with technology. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's no excuse, honestly. I think it's just people afraid and that's why they don't want to go. Well, people, yeah. I, I'm reading this book, uh, the four hour work week and it's by this guy, Tim Ferriss. He's like this brilliant guy. Have you read it? Yeah. I listened to it on uh, audio a while back. Yeah. It's good. But he says in there that people are more afraid of, uh, people are more, People are more, un- fuck, I'm going to butcher it. I think it's, uh, people are more comfortable with unhappiness than they are with uncertainty. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I believe so, that. Like, if someone's sitting at home and, like, they know they don't like their job. They know they don't like what they're doing in life. But, and there's this other option of, like, living overseas or just going on a long-term vacation. But there's all these questions, like, how am I going to pay for it? Like, what's the, uh the language going to be like, and they just find these reasons to, and not to say like those aren't legitimate, but you know, I feel like it's easier than people think it is, you know? Yeah. Well, and then that type of like self-talk, you end up talking yourself out of it. Find all these reasons why it won't work. And then you side with that. There's another quote, um, I came across it. Most people would rather live with a problem they can't solve than to accept a solution they can't understand. So I think that goes perfectly with the, hey, like, I'd rather be unhappy and comfortable than uncertain and uncomfortable. The uncertainty really, like, fucked people up. And, oh, man. Yeah, and I had some regrets going to Thailand, too, on that final flight. I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, that last little, like, voice in the back of your head is like, okay, shit. But then everything, once I got there, all those worries, like, went away. Once I checked in the first hostel, I, I didn't have that worry again the entire time. What were some of your uh, hesitations before leaving? What were you afraid of? Oh, man. Just like ne- had never done it before. And the fact that it takes so long to get there. I mean, mm. was it was like three or four flights. And it's like you can't really decide at the last minute that this is not for you. Right. Because it's going to take another like X amount of dollars, X amount of flights, you know, you talking to people and you're already over there. Right. So it's um, yeah, it's it's just different. So you kind of just, you know, stick to the plan. Right. And if you deviate from it, which, um, you know, is bound to happen. That's another thing. Like, don't have such a rigid plan. Have shit you want to do. But having a rigid plan, that'll be out the window in the first four days. Yeah. Especially if you want to have fun and like like live organically right like if you have this plan and like you got to go to some temple but then this cute girl's like hey come to dinner with me like what are you gonna say no you know what i mean like cancel your fucking plans like go on the date you know what i mean (laughs) yeah oh yeah yeah you need to have that openness especially if you're staying in hostels which i people vilify hostels man they're awesome i have never had a bad experience i mean you can stay some shit hostels don't get me wrong but like japan's were like beautiful Mm. uh thailand's were the only thing you really have to make sure of is that you have ac because if you're going you know during the hot season or the rainy season it's fucking thick Um, dude (laughs) yeah but yeah i mean that's it hostels are great yeah and you meet people and they're like oh we're going to do this you want to come and you'll be like 
oh, like I did a bunch of research, but I had no idea that like that was here. You're like, yeah, it's like an hour away. And then you meet some random people from a bunch of different countries and then you end up going to have dinner with them. So that's another nice thing too, is you meet new people at these places and you sit down with them and have a beer and have some food and you can ask them anything right yeah. you're gonna see him for three yeah. days and like you get the best of people too when they're traveling i think because everyone's in a good mood so to like be able to sit down with some random stranger and have a good like fluent conversation that doesn't have all the awkward pauses is yeah see i love that part of traveling just like the little things like that yeah and people are so open and vulnerable and like if they embarrass themselves like fuck it like i'm gonna see you for the next two days and then after that probably never again in my life so i'm just gonna open up and be myself <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can be more comfortable, you know, when you're kind of like around your hometown too, like you see people out. Everyone kind of has their like image or version of you and mm. you kind of like maybe reflect that back. Well, you're in a foreign country, be like, dude, I don't give a fuck. I really don't, you know, just like go with the flow. And especially if you're traveling alone, like you want to meet new friends and meet new people. So you really have to be open. That's the main thing. You can't be standoffish and like insecure and, yeah, you really got to get past some of those things, which is, um, you know, people have asked me, I'm like, I think everybody should take a solo trip. Oh, somewhere. yeah. Everybody. Yeah, why do you think so? Oh. You just, like, kind of figure out new parts of yourself. I mean, to put it simply, right, like, you encounter new problems and say you're by yourself, like, you have to solve them. Right, if you're somebody who would typically like call your mom and like, mm. or, or your father or like one of your friends or say you've got like a network of people and you rely on them to solve your problems, like, like you really have to be self-sufficient, which gives you that confidence, right? You oh, end yeah. up solving the problem and you'd be like, okay, yeah. like you do realize like the anxiety that you have is not gonna help you solve that problem. You're in a foreign country, like say you are out of money or have been robbed, like you just gotta like, focus on solving it and you know once you do um and eventually you will you know you kind of like build up that confidence over time so now like i feel like i can just hop on a, a plane and go anywhere i know like yeah, strategically dude. what i need to do but like it's it's all the same just different countries and you just need to worry about the specifics of that country but the procedure for traveling is is all the same you know mm, mm. yeah Dude, I feel that, man. Yeah, I felt the same way. Um, like, my biggest kind of uh, trip... Well, I mean, I was living over there, but I still view it as, like, a trip. Uh, was when I was in Japan. And, dude, the fucking bureaucracy and all the paperwork and, like, how organized of a society is, dude, it is fucking difficult to manage, man. Like, I don't know if I told you when you were over there, but, like, each day of the week, there was a different material of trash that you have to take out. So, like, on Tuesday, it's a different material than Wednesday, and, like... They have all these kinds of plastics, like under each plastic bottle, there's like a, a number. This one's like five, but they mm -hmm. have like recycle six or recycle seven. You have to take them out on a different day. I didn't know any of this shit, dude. So like my trash was just <laughs> piled up in my fucking bathroom for a month. I didn't touch it because I didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> so I fucking... Oh, that's a headache. <laughs> dude, it was a smelly headache, man. I fucking called the municipal office and like, in my broken Japanese had to like explain my situation and like long story short, it was fine. But like, those are, that's one of those things where it's like you, i never saw that coming. Like I felt like I was like a five year old trying to like learn how to do chores. I was like, how do you take out the trash? And, uh, yeah. So I feel like when I'm coming back home to the States, like so much easier, dude, I just bring that shit to the curb. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, when I don't know. Done. I just feel like, yeah. I feel like when you're traveling, like, it's kind of like life on hard mode. You know what I mean? Like, you feel like you're a kid again. And then oh, so yeah. coming back to normal life, yeah, like you said, just way more confident. Oh, yeah. And then think, like, whenever you're traveling, the things you take for granted, like, oh, I know where the grocery store is, or like, oh, I know where the train station is here, right? Because, like, and mm. you're kind of on autopilot when you're at home. But when you're traveling, like, something as simple as, like, the recycling, like, what the fuck? Like, I have no idea. And then like, especially with the Japanese culture, right? It's very like discipline oriented. And like, you know, I want to say you're shamed for not knowing, but you're expected to know even something as simple as I remember the escalators. Oh, right. 
Can you imagine yeah. Atlanta having that? Like, Wait, Marta tell me trying what, to... what, do you, what do you mean about the escalators, Brad? Oh, man. So, um, I forget. I might have this backwards and correct me. But uh-huh. in Tokyo, if you're standing and you're not walking up the escalator, you need to be on the right. Is that yeah, correct? I, think it's the, I know Osaka I think it's was the opposite. left in Tokyo. Okay. Yeah, and same then, concept, yeah, though. Yeah, then the opposite side would be like your passing lane. And it is so orderly. Once you get there, it looks like a utopian society. Like people follow it. People yeah. are very respectful. Um, yeah, that was one of the things I looked up to was train etiquette before I went there. Like, hey, like don't talk on your phone. If there's an elderly woman, I mean, that's that's more so in Japan than everywhere. But like, you know, people would get up for somebody who's disabled. Um, and then the businessmen get priority um, on the seats on the trains. Um, yeah, just learning like whenever they're going to shove you into, uh, the train <laughs> during rush hour, like what that times to, to avoid. No, cause I, I avoided that. Um, oh, maybe once actually, no, I went to golden guy, you know, the small oh, bar district hell yeah. yeah, and I missed the train cause right. They end at midnight. So yeah. I got like pissed drunk until six in the morning until the trains open hey. and then was like still drunk and they were shoving me into the train, and I'm like, oh, my God. Like, and then trying to figure out the, the train system when you're drunk, which Google Maps was an absolute lifesaver in mm. Japan. Um, once you figure it out, it's easy, but there's so many stops, and you're like, oh, my God, it's in Japanese. So, yeah. um, well, Tokyo's a beast of a city, dude. And, like, one uh, thing I didn't realize living in Japan until – well, actually, I, I realized this very quickly the hard way, but, like, there's different companies of – railways like they have like the japanese government like the jr line and then they have like all these private companies and you're like get off the jr line and get on this private company a and then like get off that yeah, one and then that. go to private company b and you have to have like all these tickets it's fucking difficult man just to go somewhere yeah, <laughs> yeah and then if you want to ride the shinkansens right if i'm pronouncing mm-hmm. that correctly the bullet yeah. trains like shinkansen. that's a whole another thing um oh man but then uh, the beautiful part of it too is if you miss your train there's one on schedule five minutes behind the next one going to the same exact place. Like yeah. I have never seen a more efficient public transportation system ever until I went to Japan. Yeah. Like gotta the entire give it up. countries like that. Yeah, dude. Got to give it up for those East Asians, man. They are very orderly folks. Yeah. It's funny. I'm actually studying for a statistics test and everything's based around quality and everything is Japanese based. What do you mean? So like, like the methodologies to have a quality system for like manufacturing, right? So you don't have enough defects. So for instance, like for like medical devices, like you need to make a hip implant, hip implant excuse me, properly or mm-hmm. else, you know, someone's going to get hurt, right? So they follow this methodology called Six Sigma, which is rooted in statistics and like how to go about solving problems. But all of it is, like, Japanese-based. And they really started to implement it in the United States after, like, World War II. Um, but, yeah, that just, you know, tells you about the quality there, which I've been on a bunch of Japanese whiskey lately because I love it. It's been great. I got Whiskey's some right here. Yeah. This is a uh, Hibiki. Bruh. How many, how many years is it aged? No. This is not aged. So the, were you with me when, when we went to um, – it's like a small little liquor store. It had it behind like a bulletproof glass case. The 30 year of that is worth like seven grand. <laughs> yeah, so amazing, I, dude. I won't be buying that. Yeah, it's really uh, good. That's like a hundred dollar bottle here in Denver. It's really God good. Damn. God damn. Did you go to any distilleries? When you, wait, hold on. We're getting, this, we're getting ahead of ourselves. This, so <laughs> you, went, you went to uh, Thailand and then other places? You went to like Myanmar or like... Vietnam or anywhere else on that like long stint no so that entire that was another month I was there was just in Thailand and my plan was so I flew into Bangkok and then worked my way south or not mm, Bangkok okay. excuse me Chiang Mai which is in the mm. northern part of Thailand and I worked my way south and I think that's the best way to to go about traveling Thailand either go north to south or south to north mm. yeah see when I went I was only there for like six days and I just got drunk on the beach <laughs> where'd you go um i flew into bangkok and then took another flight to the pp islands oh sweet yeah yeah it was fun but it was a little too touristy and like i just feel like 
the whole vibe where I was at least was just to get completely blackout drunk every single night. <laughs> and oh uh, yeah, just exhausting, you know. Yeah, the shitty liquor, the bad hangovers, and then you got to move on to the next place. Yeah. Oh, man, I'm getting a stomach ache just thinking about it, man. Oof. Did you ever drink the blackout buckets on Copenhagen? I did. I did. Did you do the, the full moon party? Nah, dude. I missed it, man. I didn't plan. See, like, I think we're a little different. Like, you, you plan pretty meticulously. But before I leave, I just, I don't know. I just see a cheap flight and I just go. So I think I missed the full moon party by a few months. I went in, like, the worst time. I was in, like the dead of summer it was like pouring rain every single day and just so hot <laughs> yeah jeez. yeah tell me about the full moon party though oh that was fun so there's a little island there's a string of three islands kosamoy kopanyan and kotal <clears throat> uh kopanyan is the middle island which is where the full moon party is and it's in the gulf of thailand i believe it, that's the body of water but um oh man they have um I guess it'd be like once a month, basically, right? For the full moon. And they have like half moon parties and they ended up, they're probably on quarter moon at this point. Like they just want people to like party on the beach. Just milking but, it, bro. <laughs> yeah, right? So, but that place was so much fun, man. Um, me and this uh, guy from the Netherlands, like ended up finding these like two uh, Japanese girls. So that was like cool. You know, you meet up with somebody in the opposite sex in a different country. And like, ooh, like you're exotic. And be like, oh, well, you're exotic. <laughs> And then, um, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just a good time. Um, <laughs> oh man, I've never seen so many people partying on a beach at once too. That's on my Instagram too. If you scroll far enough back, I'm sure I've got some videos too, but yeah. just mob with people and, uh, it's all like EDM. So if that, if that's your scene, Jesus, like, bro. it's, it's fun. It sounds intense, man. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a good time, but it's one of those, like you do it, you go party for like two days, you're on a bender, then you're like. I need a break. I need to go God. relax on the beach somewhere. Yeah. And then that's when you go to one of the other islands. So it's a little God, bit more man. laid back. So intense, dude. I don't know if I could do that these days. Oh, Would man. you go back? I'm the same way. Hmm? Would you go back to the full moon party? Yeah. Would you do it again? Yeah, I would do it. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Well, it's Even a little different now, right? I'm, yeah. Well, I'm still, like, I'm still single, right? I'm like 27. So it's not like... I feel like I'm like aged out of it yet, but um, yeah, if I ever find myself in that part of the world again, like, absolutely. Nice. Yeah. nice. Especially if I'm with some other people that want to go too. I, I think that's another good part about traveling is if you've been there and you're with a group of people, you're like, Hey, like, listen to me, like, let's go. <laughs> like you guys will have a great time, know exactly what to do. Rally yeah. the troops. Let's fucking go. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. So you were in Thailand and then you like, I guess you went home and then so I saw you in the fall of 2018 and you came to visit me when I was living in Japan. Um, and I think at that time you were on like a, like an East Asia stint, right? Like you went there in Korea and a few other places. No. So my plan originally, so before that I was actually in Egypt on a layover. And then before that I was in Greece for my little brother's graduation present. Um, so we did that. But my plan was I was going to like live abroad for like six months. Mm -hmm. And this sounds crazy, but we flew over the Atlantic and to like spend time in Greece. And then I was like, well, I'm like this close to uh, I'm going to digress a little bit, but I'm, I'm this close to Egypt. So let me go spend a layover on Egypt and like see the pyramids. And then I was like, well, my main plan is to like start north somewhere in Asia and work my way south. And then I flew to Japan from Egypt. And that was going to be the start of my six-month journey. And I was just going to work my way south to Australia. Ooh. I was going to bounce around. I knew how cheap it was. I knew, like, Japan and Australia would have been, like, the more expensive parts of the trip. But everywhere in between, like, Southeast Asia would have been, like, you know, very cheap compared to, you know, the living standards in the United States. Yeah. Um, but I actually left and went home right after I saw you... And uh, I think we spent time in Kyoto. I think it was the yeah. last place I went to before I flew back. Yeah, you were sleeping on my floor in Osaka. We were taking day trips. <laughs> I remember that. I was on the yoga mat and I had hey. two jackets that I used as, <laughs> as my blankets. I was like, oh Dude, boy. I, I felt so fucking bad. I was like, this guy's come from Georgia to see me and like I'm making him sleep on the floor. But dude, I had just moved into my apartment. Like I had nothing. I, I had like, You were on a blanket. cot? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was sleeping on a cot. Yeah, 
<laughs> did you have a cot the whole time? Did you eventually get a bed or anything? No, never got a bed. Just had the cot. <laughs> oh, yeah. How many square was pretty, feet was that? Uh, Dude, I don't know. It was, like, as big as, like, a bedroom plus, like, a kitchen. But, it, it like, it felt bigger because, like, each room had its own door. Like, I had a door to the laundry room slash shower room. And then I had a door to the toilet. So the toilet had its own door. And then, like, in the main area, there was, like, a kitchen. And then there was a door. And then my bedroom. So it was, like, for Japan standards, it was actually kind of fucking big. Um, but, dude, that toilet, bro. You remember that toilet? Nah. Maybe not. I know they all have, like, remotes and shit. <laughs> dude, you would open the door to the toilet room. And, like, you would hear the engine start whirring. It would, like, whirr. And, like, the water in the bidet would start to heat up and the toilet seat would start to heat up. Yeah, it knew you were entering oh, the room. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I remember going to 7-Elevens and you see, like, this extensive remote on, like, the left side. You're like, what does this do? I remember they had, like, fart sounds and, like, stuff like that. Like, if you felt self-conscious about, like, shitting there, they, they got you covered. Yeah, they, they have background they thought music. about everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. But hey, they brilliant. also had like, um, you know how you can like put down the piece of paper on the toilet seat? Yeah. I remember some places had like a conveyor belt and it would move around and you'd press a button and it would give you like a new sheet. I was like, whoa, dude. Like a fresh you know, need to do this. square. Like it would like cut you a fresh amount of like paper. Yeah. And it would just like move around the toilet seat. <laughs> it would just give you a new sheet. I was like, what the fuck, dude? dude I thought about funny. everything. That's brilliant, dude. I mean, dude, Japan, the toilets are inspirational, bro. Like, how are we still, like, we're in the dark. Like, we might as well be shitting in a hole over here, Brad. Right. They're over there, like, shitting inside of robots. Like, what the fuck are we doing? Oh, have you ever been, like, shitting a hole? Like, there's just a hole in the ground, you just gotta squat over it, and that's, you gotta do your business like that? Yeah, in Thailand, I had this, like, really spicy food. It was, like, a bag of, I went to, like, the slum in Bangkok for a day, and saw the street vendor and he had like a bag of apples but it was like soaked in like vinegar and like chili it was extremely spicy and i ate the bag and yeah had to shit in a hole with like a fire ass it was not pleasant <laughs> oh fuck <laughs> yeah that's when you want a comfortable toilet and you want to be able to relax for a while but <laughs> right <laughs> you're, you're sitting there like tearing your acl a little bit each time <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Like blowing out your knees. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh man, dude. Yeah, and no, right after like that, too. Like fuck. <laughs> actually, that toilet experience was at a massage parlor. Like I went to go. Like I was. I was. I had a massage, and uh, we were like getting ready or whatever. And then I was like, oh, I gotta go shit. So I went to the bathroom, shit in a hole, and no running water. Like no sink or like, they just had like a big, like hundred gallon. Uh, like trash can full of water and you just like picked up like you just washed your hands in that basically it was not sanitary and then right oh, after man. that I got on a massage table like fully naked and this dude like <laughs> have, did you get a massage in Thailand? oh yeah dude I got it like yeah. every other day they're like five bucks it's crazy like you get naked and they're like fucking they're doing yoga with you bro like stretching you and like cracking your back and Oh, yeah. Thai massages are way different than like a deep tissue or what's normal, like Swedish massage. Yeah, it's like, yeah, you're like a piece of yoga equipment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good shit. Uh, so how long were you in Japan? So you planned to travel for six months and then you were there for like a month or two? In Japan? No. Oh, man. I think Japan was about a month too. Yeah. I want to say my entire like um, trip between Greece Egypt and Japan was probably maybe close to two months, maybe just under it. Mm. And I spent, yeah, um, a month in Japan. So Kyoto, Osaka, um, Tokyo. Um, I think that was it. Yeah, I spent most of my time there. Tokyo has so much to offer. I wish I spent more time there. Um, I think I was there for like two weeks. But um, yeah, so, I really so wish I went to like a sumo uh, hey. championship. Bro, it's never too late, bro. Once Japan opens up, I will go with you. Let's do it, man. I know there's a season, right? It's like October, November or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, Summer's really hot, but... Dude, the second they open up, I'm gonna fucking go. 
<laughs> I kind of miss in Japan, to be honest. Um, yeah, good people too. I just like it. And, and um, I don't know, it's not, this sounds bad, but they're not like an intimidating culture, right? I yeah. think people are like hospitable. And then also like, I mean, you're what, a six foot two white dude? Like you stick out like mm-hmm. a sore thumb too. Mm-hmm. And if you're black, right? You're like a celebrity. Oh yeah. <laughs> people like taking pictures. They yeah. want to feel your hair. <laughs> oh, they do? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I haven't traveled with That's any. That's funny. I traveled with a, my uh, Indian American friend and like, yeah, he was a celebrity in all the bars. Sure. Oh yeah. For better or worse, right? Like you stick out in a good way and a bad way. Like. I don't know, Japan, they're fucking racist over there. So, like, anytime something bad happens, like with COVID, like, even now you can't go. Even if you quarantine and are vaccinated and wear a mask and do everything right, like, just because you're American, you can't go. So. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. there's ups and downs. Yeah, I wonder how that changes things. Well, especially now with, like, you know, Russia and Ukraine right now. So I'm curious, like, if that's going to deter people who are, like, on the fence of traveling, that they're Mm. just like, nope, nope. Uh, definitely for certain countries I can see that but I wonder if like even like Europe I mean Greece is like pretty close you know how people Mm. like it's still far but you know Greece is a desirable location but they'll be like oh you know with what's going over there now or what's going on you know I don't want to be caught in that situation and then to add COVID on top of that like Mm, yeah it's a pain yeah that means cheaper flights though (laughs) right wants to go (laughs) Yeah, I follow this guy who sends me emails like Scott's cheap flights, mm-hmm. and he's been sending me a bunch of deals lately because of everything going on. It's like, oh, you can oh, get yeah? here for like a hundred bucks, or you can get here for like two hundred bucks. Oh yeah, fly to Kiev, Ukraine for fifty dollars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, just pay for your luggage. We'll get you there for free. Right. Make sure you have travel insurance and a bulletproof vest. <laughs> yeah. Jeez, for real. It's just so crazy. So you were, so I want to get back to, um, why did you, why did you come home so early? Like you, you were planning to be there for six months and you were just, you were on, on the road for two. So why'd you come home? My problem is I always try to do too much at once. So, um, I literally flew around the world in 30 days and I was like, holy fuck, like the jet lag and the being exhausted. And when I say like I flew around the world in 30 days, I mean that, that means like 48 hours, like in the sky that's another like 30 hours worth of layovers. I think I was on like 12 flights. I mean, like little flights, like here and there to get to places. Um, I was just like, Oh my God, like I am so exhausted. Um, I, it was just too audacious. You know, if I just, you know, flew to Japan, um, did that, but I was like trying to be strategic about it and line it up. Um, cause my little brother two weeks prior to me going to Japan, we were in Greece for his college graduation trip. So I was like, okay, I'm already traveling. Like, <laughs> mm. Greece is so close to Japan, right? So let me just like take another <laughs> fucking 16 hour flight to get there. So that, that I just did too much. And I, I think I wore myself out. So I was like, you know, I'm ready to go back home. Um, but you know, back home for like a month or two and I'm like, I'm ready to go again. So. <laughs> did you head out after that? Did you go somewhere? Uh, I'm trying to think. No, I think I just did a bunch of like local stuff, like where I could drive to. Like I'd never been to Asheville before, you know, I'd never been to Nashville, Tennessee, um, just yeah. doing stuff around that you could drive to from Atlanta, but nothing like too big. Yeah. Yeah. So like after you came home, did you, did it like reshape the way you looked at traveling? Cause like me personally, like after I lived in Japan, I read this book called Vagabonding and it's, it's kind of like a spiritual guide on like how to travel slow and like travel authentically and like interact with, you know, the real, whatever, wherever you are. And, um, it just really like shaped the way I look at travel. So like I came home and like, I was able to like be a vagabond, like in other places, like pretty much anywhere. Like if you just stay open and like ask the right questions and you know, so did you yeah. find that to be true when you came home? I think, um, well, Thailand kind of prepped me for it. That was like my eye-opening experience. And I was like, oh, I can do this like anywhere. Um, yeah, and then, and then doing it correctly, you know, to have cruises as like the contrast, like that's when you're like, oh, okay, like what I'm doing right now, like in Thailand, that's traveling. All this other stuff that the cookie cutter stuff is not traveling. Um, yeah, you don't meet locals. Yeah, you're like stuck with this itinerary. It's like a... It's like a tyrant. You have to keep to your calendar. 
Ooh. Um, yeah, it's like having the fr- right? yeah having the freedom and just talking with people and just figuring out as you go along, and seeing how hospitable people are. Like that's the way to do it. You know, you just kind of got to get over that like, that first hump of fear. Then after that, you're like everything's so blissful and everything's like new and novel too. Um, it keeps you on your toes, keeps you engaged the whole time too. So, um, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I was looking at some of your videos of like Tijuana, and <laughs> um, yeah, man, I bet that was an experience. Tijuana was intense, dude. Tijuana definitely like tested my own like principles because I was, you know, I like to tell people like, yeah, don't worry about getting a hotel. Like you can just find one there and there's always a hotel room and like just you know trust your instincts and like just simple shit like that like really tested also like oh yeah like places aren't as dangerous as you think well tijuana's fucking dangerous (laughs) (laughs) and i couldn't find a hotel room there so i was like damn am i just like am i just full of shit like am i lying to these people but i think i hope i'm hoping that was like a uh an outlier but yeah tijuana was rough (laughs) oh man yeah, from most of the time, like hostels, especially people come, people go. There's usually a bed available, and I know that like I'm a like a a planner, but like mm-hmm. in Thailand, I only planned my first like three days worth of accommodations. The the rest of the month was just like as I showed up, or I'd hop on Hostel World like the day before I I went there. Same with Japan. Um, yeah, it's super easy to find stuff. People don't hang out in hostels for too long, and you know they they shove like eight bunks in a room. So yeah. it's not that hard if you're traveling by yourself to find something. And then it's cheaper too, you know? No, exactly. I think people have, like, it's it's like we were talking about earlier, like people are afraid of the unknown. And I think, you know, not knowing where you're going to sleep is like some like fundamental, like fear inducing thing, you know? So I think people like to know, like I was talking with this girl yesterday and she's going to Europe in four months and she already knows she's going to be there for, I think like a month three weeks, something like that. So the trip is in, you know, four or so months and she already knows every hotel she's going to sleep in. She has everything booked. And I'm like, don't do that. Like, don't, please don't do that. Like, you don't have to do that. Like wait a week before you go. Like just, you don't have to, I don't know. And that's where I get into like this weird mode where I'm like, Oh, I don't want to tell people how to travel. But for me, like it's way more fun to just figure it out as you go. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's certain things. I mean, I guess it depends. I say for the most part, yeah, if you're doing like hostile travel, like you really don't need to plan far in advance. And then have you ever gotten the argument too with, um, or I guess the difference between men and women traveling solo? Um, no. There are some that are like, okay, well, I'm a girl. Like it's different. Like you're a guy, right? Like you can, oh, something yeah. happens to you physically, right? And you're by yourself. You're going to be able to handle yourself, handle yourself way better than I would. Um, but even like going to hostels and like talking to, talking to other girls, cause you know, how hostels, you can either do women only, or you can do like a co-ed. Mm-hmm. I, I've never heard a bad story from the girls there. They're like, no, like the guys are respectful. Um, they leave me alone. You know, obviously if I'm going out on the streets, I'll make sure I'm with a group of people, like if I'm going out mm-hmm. drinking and stuff like that. But like for the most part, it's, you know, it's really no different. I would say besides like the physicality part, um, mm-hmm. you know, you're maybe a target for some other stuff, but it's not like, yeah, those worries are exacerbated in your head. It's not as bad once you get over there. That's for sure. Yeah. And I mean, I would say to anybody listening, like just do a trial run, like go to somewhere in your country and just like go for a, a long weekend and see how you like it. Cause dude, the first time I solo traveled, I like fell in love with it immediately. I'm like, no one's going to tell me where to go. No one's going to tell me what to eat. I am on my own. Like, I will do exactly what I want. Oh, yeah. yeah. You're on your own pace the whole time. Yeah, and that's perfect. So there's a lot of arguments having with traveling when you're with other people. Like, oh, I want to do this or oh, I want to do this. You don't have to compromise for anybody. Yeah. Yeah, like, I want to do it. this. I want to do it now. Yeah. Like, I'm only here for three days. Like, sorry, but I'm going to go. I'm going to do this. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that dude, that's like true freedom right there. It's like at the whim of a hat, like change of plans like let's go here let's book a flight that's gonna you know take me four hours away but it's just because i can i have no itinerary and like that sounds way more interesting than what i was gonna do so let's exactly do it. and dude you you learn so much faster on the road like like being in a hostel in florence as opposed to like reading a book like reading a guidebook 
or like talking to people in a hostel in Florence, talking to locals, you know, like you can learn way faster when you're actually there, like what you're actually, what you actually want to do. You don't have to fucking, you know, read about it. Yeah. And then that's a headache too, right? Like, oh, it's in this chapter in this book. I got to go to the index, but how about buy somebody a beer and chat them up and say, <laughs> what are your plans? Uh, way easier, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, dude. Well, any, uh, are you good on time? I know we've been chatting for like an hour. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm good. Okay. Well, do you have any plans to wait? So I saw on your Insta that like you like got a dog. Is that right? Oh yeah. Damn, bro. You're so you're tied down, man. Tied down. Yeah. <laughs> so he's like a year and like two months now. Yeah. His name's Ollie. He's a golden retriever. So uh, I got that. But I'm not like one of those people like, oh, I got to like be around him all the time, which when they're a puppy, you definitely do. But like as time goes on, no, if I, if I need to board him for like two weeks or keep him with a friend, you know what I mean? I have no problem doing that. But I probably honestly could not do like a, you know, like a two month stint yeah. um, anymore. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, no, I have no problem for like two weeks, which I'm definitely going to do that in the future. Um, so you got yeah. any plans? I want to go to Croatia. I'm trying to plan that with Ross right now, my little brother. So I really want to go to Split uh, Duvarik. Um, What's that? Yeah, that's been uh, that's been on my list for a while. I'm trying to think where else I would go. Yeah, I, what is I that? really want to go back to Japan. What's that? Where Where do you want to go in Croatia? Uh, Split and Duvarik, I believe is how you pronounce it. Those are like the two main places. The two it's like main a beach town there. or something, or. Yeah, it's like an old town, like right on, um, you know, like the waterway right there. It's just, it's just beautiful, like old, like timely city. Um, mm. Yeah, I just want to go there. Yeah, kind of like a Euro trip, and then you know maybe a layover in Amsterdam. I got a bunch of places I need to go see in uh, Europe still. Yeah, Europe's wide open, bro. They're uh, wide open, man. You just gotta be vaxxed. Yeah, I got that. Which fuck. Kind of was regretting it afterwards. I felt like fuck for 24 hours right afterwards. <laughs> I felt way worse after the vaccine shots than I did after having COVID. But. Damn, shouty. About to get me demonetized. <laughs> oh, shit. You're on Patreon, right? No, no, no. I'm fucking around, dude. Oh, okay. yeah. I well, keep no, forgetting looking... about the guidelines. Yeah, that's crazy. Nah, bro, I don't give a shit. YouTube. Um, but, uh, yeah, I've been looking at trips to Europe, too, and, like, you got to be boosted now, and, like, in France, you have to, like, show your Vax card to go anywhere. Like, to get food or, like, to be a part of public life, you have to be boosted, fully vaccinated. Oh, man. So. Jeez. Yeah, yeah it's coming to that now. Yeah, they're finding people, too. I saw it's, like, 16 grand if you, like, fake the Vax card. Which really? is pretty simple, right? You just fudge some numbers, put your name on there, stuff like that. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dude, I met... uh when I was in, I, you know, I, I spent some time in Colombia, like four or so months and I, there's a big black market down there, dude. I mean, as you can imagine, and like a lot of people are getting fake fax cards. Like it's a real thing. Um, my That's buddy called me, he was like, uh, he's like, yeah, I went to this doctor and he basically just like pulled out the vaccine from a clot, like a, whatever the fuck he pulled out, like one of the shots and then just threw it away and then wrote the card and. But he like fudged the serial number and he's like, damn, am I going to like get caught? And he was like really tripping about it. But it's a thing, man. People are faking them. <laughs> oh, people don't give a fuck. I, my buddy just went to Mexico a couple months ago. Um, and he goes, you know, you have to like test when you get there. And then you have to like test while you're there too. He goes, he showed up at the table where they're testing and all they had, they had like 50 to 60 like negative tests. He goes, they were basically like just proving that you were negative, whether they had to like forge the test or like, you know, or make them, you know, make them negative on purpose. And they would just uh, give you one and be like, yeah, you're good to go. Cause like, think if you're like travel business or like, dude, you know, we don't give a fuck. Like we just want people to come here. So they're like literally like faking the test. Like, yeah, here you go. You're good. Dude, Mexico go crushed it with COVID, dude. They did not close for a single goddamn day. <laughs> I didn't give a shit. They made so much money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then people, like, everything was opening back up. They're like, okay, where do we go? I'd be like, Mexico. Let's go there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was in Colombia, and, like, you'd think, you know, like, Latin America would be kind of, like, homogenous in their approach, you know, like Europe or something. But so 
South America, they take it very serious to do. People wearing a mask all over the place, outside. Like, I see people on motorcycles with masks. I'm like, <laughs> the fuck are you doing? But, like, a few hundred miles north of Mexico, like, a buddy of mine, like, went on a little trip to Mexico for a weekend. He, like, sent me a Snapchat of him in, like, a packed nightclub. So... They didn't give it a makes shit. It makes no sense. <laughs> yeah, where the line is drawn is a fuzzy one. Be like, hey, like, yeah, you can go to a packed bar and, like, drink all the time. But, like, you know, if you're five feet away from somebody on a plane and, God forbid, you don't put your mask up in between sips, <laughs> you're, like, going to get kicked off and, like, put on the TSA blacklist. Yeah, even though, no even though they said, like, and I feel like the science isn't keeping up with, or the, um, the policy, like, the bureaucracy isn't really keeping up with the science. Like, now we know that masks don't really do fuck all uh, unless it's a N95. So like, why do I have to wear a fucking bandana on my face on a flight? <laughs> yeah. Know? There's a study like a federal of law. Uh, Israel. It was like the cloth mask are only 15% effective. I'm like, well shit. I'm like, yeah, it's not really doing much. And it's funny. Like people on the opposite side are like, Oh, well like if you're putting the mask on, then you're actually just like trapping it in there. So you got people with both. My thing about it was, like, I, look, I don't give a fuck, but um, you're not going to, like, force, like, healthy people to wear it. And that's when, like, I'm sure you see my Instagram posts, like, you know, authoritarian, totalitarian stuff. I'm like, look, this is no longer about public health safety. This is about something way bigger than that. So right. that's my, my caveat with it. Yeah, and, like, interpersonally, too, like, people will judge you. Like, I get looks, or I did in Colombia, at least. I got looks for, like, not wearing my mask outside. You know what I mean? It's like, well are we listening to the science or are we just like being cunts to each other and like trying to make each other feel bad? You know what I mean? Yeah. And these people aren't even like, they're not even like STEM majors. They don't even know how to read the science. Like now, like, look, I deal with statistics like all day with my job and you'd be amazed of how people will like interpret the exact opposite thing of what they need. And they don't even know what data to dispense with either. So it's like very, uh, yeah, the people interpreting it are you can, and that's the thing with statistics too. You just pick what side of the statistic you want to be on. Be like, oh, it's eighty percent effective, or oh, it fails at twenty percent, or something like that. And then you, you know, have people interpret and perceive things on opposite sides of the end. I mean, same thing with like, you know, go to CNN or Fox. You know, the yeah. narrative is just the exact opposite. So you can do that with statistics too, and I think it really confuses people. Right. So you're saying do like or not do. With the political example, it's like the same facts, but people get different, like, they extrapolate, like, different conclusions from the same facts, basically. Yeah. So here, here's a good example is um, employees who take a 10-minute work break are 90% more likely to die of heart disease. And you read that article and you're like, oh, what the fuck? And then you dig a little bit deeper and you're like, oh, those people who take 10-minute breaks at work are blasting cigarettes mm -hmm. so it's like okay well you forgot to leave that out so it's called descriptive statistics but it's not very descriptive you can lie with it and i think one of the quotes was it's easy to lie with statistics but it's hard to tell the truth without them and so that quote really like stuck with me so yeah. you know apply that to everything covid based and any numbers mm -hmm. well i mean i feel like uh the same can kind of be said or something similar can kind of be said about like the news like I feel like a lot of people are like, oh, you're going to Colombia? Like, isn't it dangerous? And aren't there, like, hijackings and, like, bombings and all this shit? And it's like, I don't know, dude. I just feel like people have a very, like, if you watch the news, which I'll be completely honest with you, I don't watch the news at all anymore, and I feel amazing. <laughs> yeah, me neither. Yeah. Your quality yeah. of life improves, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Like, you don't have to argue about Ukraine. Like, the only time I don't care about what's happening in Ukraine is if I want to go there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Or if like a true world war broke out, that would be bad. But before that, like, I don't really want to hear about it. <laughs> but um, what I was trying to say is like, I feel like people will watch the news and be like, oh, well, that's dangerous. I saw this story about how this is dangerous. And I'm like, well, have you seen the news from Atlanta? Like yeah there's right. hijackings and <laughs> shootings every day like you're just choosing to be afraid of this foreign place because i don't know whatever reason yeah they're biased but like atlanta's the number one sex sex drug or sex trafficking place in the world no shit yeah so like i mean even like go down certain streets in chicago right so people want to cherry pick and be like oh there's carjacking shit like that there same with um 
you know, whenever I was in Egypt on my layover, I had like an hour long taxi ride with this guy. And he was very curious how me as an American perceived Egypt and what the news was saying about Egypt. He was very curious of like how his country was being received by the West. Mm -hmm. Um, I was like, I don't, you know, I don't want to see much on Egypt. Um, but rest assured, if something bad happened, you would see it. Oh, you would see it. Yeah, Yeah. There's no good news, right? It's all bad. It's all just like this happened, this happened. Um, dude. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Stay off I remember it. my, dude, my grandfather, before I left for Japan, he just kept telling me about like kamikazes and like how bad it was in World War II. And I'm just like, how is that even like, why? Are, <laughs> what are you talking about, man? Like, it's fine. Like people live normal last lives. It's not like a war zone anymore. <laughs> I'd be like, yeah, that was like 80 years ago too, right? <laughs> the 1940s. Yeah. Yeah. And just like the stories of like a grandma going to the store and buying apples and going home, like that's not news. Like no one gives a shit. So like that's, no one hears about it, you know? And that's why I feel like yeah. it's so important. Like as someone who makes, you know, travel videos to show people like, Hey, there's, there's just normal ass people here. Like the world isn't that dangerous. Even dude, I was even looking up uh, travel vlogs from uh, Acapulco, Mexico. It's like the number one narco area in Mexico. There's like, it's supposed to be really bad, but I looked up travel vlogs and it's fine for tourists, dude. Yeah. Like surprisingly, you can just go there and like the cartel's not going to bother you. Guess what? Cuz fucking white people buy drugs. They don't want to fuck with you. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. It's yeah. like if you uh stay in your own little circle and you walk outside, you just meet a bunch of people going throughout their day-to-day lives, like, buying groceries, like, just wanting to get fucked up, like, here and there, and, like, have a beer. Um, yeah, it's not, like, the doom and gloom that a lot of people think it is. I mean, you can get into trouble, right? Like, any, like, bar and nightlife has, like, you know, us being, like, men in our 20s, like, if you go down to South America, you get offered cocaine left and right, right? The mm. dude selling paintings is not selling paintings, right? <laughs> Just like right. a dude in Jamaica who who runs the jet skis is fucking selling weed. He didn't give two shits about the jet skis, right? So, like, especially South America, you just get offered cocaine left and right. So if you can get in trouble if you really want to, but, like, yeah. yeah. You just keep keep to your own business, and, and that's it, man. Yeah. Know, the world is a lot safer than what people think it is. Um, you know, shit happens in other areas, obviously, but most of the places you'll go to, yeah. Normal yeah. people doing normal things, just like me and you, where we grew up. That's just exactly. where they grew up, doing the same exact thing. Yeah. No, I totally agree. Yeah, dude. Cool. Uh, let's see. I had I took a few notes. Oh. Let's see. Oh, okay. So you're a big planner. Like, you like to, like, make a spreadsheet and fucking really decide what you're going to do before you go. Yeah, the first time I did. Now I'm a little bit more lax about it, but I still like to have like a, I guess like the th- top three to five things I really want to do. But as far as the logistics, not so much. I'll like figure that out as I go. Cause I know like if I go to Europe, be like, oh, get Euro rail. Like same thing in Japan, get Japan mm-hmm. rail. So more so if I'm planning, it's just to be financially conscious or conscious of it because if you have to do things like right then and there it might cost you more money so i would say to the extent of which i plan is to save money Mm. not so much as to have like a rigid schedule of what i will and won't do you know i have my top picks but um yeah i'm not going to be like your friend that girl who has everything planned out um yeah yeah and then and then you're rushed too then you feel like you have to be at these places and you create this like level of anxiety on top of your trip when the whole point's supposed to be to enjoy yourself yeah but it's funny people would think the opposite right they would think oh i don't have any plans like i'm really anxious now like what do i do um but yeah just keep that past FOMO. that yeah 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 well i mean it's really just an attitude thing right like i feel like people apply the same like standards of predictability that they do in their everyday nine to five life. Like I know I'm going to be here. I know I'm going to go to this restaurant. I know I'm going to see Susie at this time. They apply that. They want that level of predictability on the road, you know, but for me, it's like, Mm -hmm. I want the exact opposite. I want things to just happen naturally, you know? 
Yeah, and that's really what you travel for, too, is the novelty of it. Yeah, what's the fun if it's predictable, right? Like, oh, man. Yeah, yeah you might as well stay home if you want that, and that's what people yeah. do do, right? And just, just watch a fucking documentary. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? I'm like, oh, I got it, I got it. Oh, man. Man, that makes me think about, so the whole reason, I'm not sure if you can see, that's like Anthony Bourdain in the back. He's probably, mm-hmm. like, top influence for traveling. I love how articulate he is. He was a great writer, mm-hmm. right? And then he didn't start traveling until his, like, mid-40s. Really? Yeah. He was, like, in serious debt, like, living in New York, like, trying to make it as a, a short-order cook or whatever he was. I, he might be he probably higher up or something like that. But, um, mm. yeah. And he didn't start traveling. He's been to all these other places. And, like, I love his description of, we'll go back to Japan, but Japan... And that's why I wanted to go to that robot show, that fucking <laughs> sober mushroom trip of a show. That was wild, dude. <laughs> it is so crazy. Yeah, it's you're right. Sober mushroom trip. It's too much, dude. I don't. I think it closed down after COVID, dude. I don't think it's around anymore. Oh man, do you remember how close we were together? Like the little table right in front of us. Yeah, there's no way that anybody could be six feet apart there. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. So he like inspired you to start traveling? Yeah, who just do all this cool shit too. And I like how it kind of like, um, it was less formal. It was like, yo, dude, like I've got the chest hair hanging out. I got a button down. I brought like three shirts. Just make sure you bring your sunglasses and like fucking buy a beer and go sit down with somebody. He'd be on like a plastic stool, just like so content with him being by himself too. Like it wasn't glamorous and I hate things that are like, oh man, like things are too nice, but like, you know, but there's like the side of repression. Like I need the truth. So mm. he was like, you know, basically like the truth of traveling for me. So I'm like, oh, okay, like this looks interesting. And then, mm. you know, and then he, he also made it less intimidating as well. What do you mean? I don't know, like you grow up, I think in the United States too, right? Like how were your parents when you first started traveling? They had all the insecurities and worries and all that too. They're terrified. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so you meet somebody who like, say you've made up your mind to go traveling. You're like, okay, well I saw this guy doing it. Like what's to say I can't do that too. Yeah. And that, that's another rule I have with traveling too. Like if you made up your mind to go, don't talk to anybody who opposes you. Because they're just going to cherry pick a bunch of bullshit. Like, you need to talk to people who will help you execute on what you've already decided for yourself. And then you'll see how much easier that conversation is than it is to have a conversation with people who oppose. It's like filled with angst and anxiety of, why are you going? And then the other person's like, no, you just do this. Oh, you you run into this situation? Do that. That's it. Yeah, there's always an answer. Yeah. 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 No, I agree with you, bro. I 100% agree, dude. I have stopped telling people where I'm going, like up until like three days before I go. Like before I left for Columbia, I was like, I just mentioned to my parents like, oh, yeah, uh, I'm heading out Friday. I'll be gone for a few weeks. And they're like, oh, where are you going? Oh, Columbia. And then, you know, I was there for four months, but I just didn't want to hear <laughs> about Pablo Escobar. Bro. I just wanted to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Be like, oh, you're not worried about this. Yeah. And then they pull up. Like your, uh, was it your grandfather? Like pulling up the stuff from Kamikaze. It's like, yeah, I'm not really sure that's still going on over there, but <laughs> I'll, I'll take your considerations. I appreciate it. Right. No, dude, it actually got so bad that I had to like show my grandmother like uh, murder statistics from like, I think I was going to Columbia. I can't remember. Oh, no. <laughs> I had to be like, yeah, this many people out of this many people die. Look, grandma, it's worse in Atlanta. Atlanta's more dangerous. Like, can we stop talking about this now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man, you might figure it out. She'd be like, "Oh man, I need to move to like Delaware or somewhere boring." <laughs> so Kansas. nothing happens. Yeah, right. Oh man. Yeah. I drove through no. Kansas, flat as fuck. Oh, uh, dude, the Midwest is terrible <laughs> to drive through. Um, oh, yeah. But no, I liked I like what you said about like how how Bourdain kept it so real that it was like really approachable and like he made it feel like it was possible. Because, dude, I I feel like I run in that run into that a lot. Like making videos online, people. The zeitgeist, I feel like, in general, is, like, very glamorous, like, Instagram, like, booty pics, like, on a yacht, like, with champagne, and, like, that's how you're supposed to travel. And then Average Joe sees that, and they're like, well, I can't do that. Like, I don't look like that. I'm not rich. I can't get a yacht. But really, at the end of the day, it's about just, just go. 
just go and then you're already you've already won you don't have to do anything sp- just be there you know oh yeah yeah and then like you can make it cheap you can make it expensive too i mean you can do both right um that's why, like southeast asia a budget's a problem you could live like a king on what it would be um how do i word this you living in atlanta is costing you more than traveling around thailand for a month hands down hands down yeah just go like i i was getting like beautiful like freshly caught fish that if i went to like i don't know let's just say like stk and got like a lobster it'd be like 50 60 you know 100 bucks there but i can get something fresh on the street with a bunch of sides for like eight dollars um yeah yeah or like even if you're not I, i love the markets too if I didn't have dinner plans, I'd just walk around, just try a bunch of different shit. Damn, you man. know, you're doing it right, bro. Yeah, that's what you do. I saw you tried the was it crickets? Was that in Colombia? <laughs> was that in? That was Mexico. Mexico, okay. Didn't you eat that yeah, in Thailand? The, um, or silkworms yeah, or something? And, oh man, yeah, silkworms, which were those were fucking nasty. Never <laughs> again. Um, oh, what else? Yeah, I tried the crickets, and I think I heard you say they put like chili powder on it. Mm-hmm. Oh, for good. yours? Yeah. yeah, they did the same thing in Thailand, and that wasn't bad. You get it's just like a crunchy Cheeto with some yeah. eyeballs and, and some crickets uh, or some, some like you know antennas. whatever they got little chirpers. <laughs> yeah, it's not that bad. Um, what else did I have? I had the scorpion on Kosan Road in Ooh. Bangkok. How was that? It's crunchy. They could have used some seasoning. It wasn't bad. It was like one of those things like the dude walks around with it on a stick and you just got to do it, right? Damn. Did it like hurt That's your tongue, the stinger? Did it like stab you? No, they're just like fucking grilled to shit. So <laughs> it's like, it just like the second you put it in your mouth, it just crunches. Like it is, there's no like venom or anything like that. Or at least yeah. I hope not. kind of did a little buzz for sure, but Oof. no, it's not bad. Uh, no, dude, I remember I saw, cause I saw your Insta stories from back then and I think you were, like, the first person I saw, like, from, you know, our area, like, growing up that had traveled long-term and, like, really fucking sent it, like, eating scorpions. Dude, I remember seeing that and I was like, Brad's fucking out of his mind, dude. Yeah. <laughs> like, hugging elephants, like, I don't know, sleeping on the floor. I thought you were crazy. And then, but I was like, dude, I didn't know this was possible. I didn't know you could go to Thailand and eat crickets. So you were actually, like, one of the first inspirations for me to start traveling, so... That's pretty cool. Oh, yeah, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. You were sending it, bro. Yeah. I remember we were growing up, and this was when, like, everything wasn't really out there on social media. I So whenever I planned my trip, you know, there were, like, a few, like, let's just say, like, travel influencers. But I really went to blogs and started mm-hmm. reading through those. And I'm like, oh, people do this? They're like, yeah, like, you know, here's how much I spent. And here's where I stayed. And I'm like oh, this is like a real thing? Because I had the same uh, concerns too. I was like, I can't afford to travel being a broke college student. No way. You know, the flight alone would, you know, set me back like four months or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, there's no way. And then you start digging into the research. Like, oh my God. That's why I love reading. It's just like, it opens up your mind like, oh, this is possible. And it's like, oh, I can do this. And like, there's like a procedure essentially. Mm -hmm. Like you're not reinventing the wheel. Like, people have done this before, and you hear their accounts, and, like, it motivates you. Like, oh, sweet. Like, let's do it. And you just get over the fear part, and then you're there, and you're having the time of your life, you know? Yeah. No, I mean, it's, like, the only people who really had to pave a way were, like, you know, Marco Polo and, like, fucking, I don't know. (laughs) Like, people that were, like, the first world travel. Yeah. (laughs) The trailblazers. But everyone else is just, like, oh, yeah, I'll just get on my phone and, like, the information is there. It's not really a secret on how to do it. You just have to like get over the fear, like you said. Yeah. So maybe that too is like a, a generational thing too. You know, so like some of the criticisms I always hear is I never hear from people our age. I always hear from people who are older, but then they needed like the road map and they needed a mm-hmm. compass, right? I'm exaggerating, <laughs> but like you had to have all these other things. You just need an iPhone and a pocket full of cash or like your passport and an ATM card. And like, that's yeah. it. And yeah. Then you'll figure the rest out. No, exactly. Yeah. It's beautiful, man. So how do you, um, get over the fear? Like, how did you, 
kind of get over the fear, like leaving, well, your first trip was Italy, but that was like study abroad. I mean, did, were you afraid of that? No, not so much. You go with friends, right? They're chaperones, professors. You're really catered to there. No, Thailand, that last flight, I remember specifically, I started like sweating bullets. It was hot, one. And two, I was nervous as hell. I'm like, yo, I'm like over here by myself. Like, what the fuck? Like, do I really want to go through the, through with this? But then, like I said, you're halfway around the world and like, it's not so easy to like change your mind. Um, <laughs> and then for me too, like, I don't want to like half-ass things. I'd rather not do it. If I can't do it correctly, I am not interested. It's a waste of my time. And I'm like that with like everything. Um, like, you know, something as simple as like working out. Like I'm not gonna work out if I'm not gonna eat well too. And like try to optimize my body. So like traveling is the same way too. So for that first one, I'm like, I'm, I'm going halfway around the world and I'm going by myself and I'm doing it for a month. And then I'm, I'm just gonna figure it out. I have, you know, I wanna go see the tigers. I wanna go see the elephants eat the scorpions, go party, you know, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And then you just got to fucking dive in. That's it. Yeah. The, the self talk can go one of two ways, but you got to silence it. Cause or else you're just thinking about thoughts and you're like creating this narrative that is never going to play out. Mm -hmm. Very rarely will it play out. And if it does, then, you know, Again, you'll still figure it out, but no, exactly. it's not to this level of severity that you're thinking. Agreed, man. And the four-hour work week, Tim Ferriss, uh, it's called like dreamlining. It's like how to make your goals like concrete as possible and like set deadlines for what you want to do. And he's like, you know, get your most ambitious goal, like your dream and write it down and then um, put like a pro con list or not a pro con, but like the absolute worst case scenario, what would happen if like for, for me, I want to go around the world. I want to travel for like two years around the world. And, you know, like the, the worst case is like, you know, you, I don't know, get stuck in like a military quarantine or like, you know, there's like the worst case scenarios. Right. And then you do the best case scenarios, right? Like completely change your outlook on life, like meet amazing people, like have an amazing story. And then you like weigh them, like which one is actually more likely to happen. And like the worst case is like on a scale of one to 10, like a two, maybe, maybe a three, if we want to be dramatic. And then the best case is like a nine or a 10. It's like easy, done, done deal. <laughs> yeah. People always so, rate the severity, but they never want to rate the occurrence of the possibility of that happening. Right. So yeah, all those bad things, I would say have a low occurrence of happening. And then all of your good things are very frequent, right? The things going on all the time that you could have a good time about. And also, like, right, just don't be a fucking moron. <laughs> Maybe we should say that, right? Like, keep a, a good head on your shoulders. Like, yeah. yeah. That's necessary. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Maybe some people shouldn't travel, but yeah, if you're not a fucking moron, you're good. <laughs> I think you'll Perfect. be all right. <laughs> cool. All right, man. Well, that seems like a good place to end it, bro. You got anything like any advice or any last minute stuff you want to say? I mean, I would just say if you're interested, you know, talk to people who have done it before and they will make you even more excited and less afraid. I mean, that is it. Find a place you want to go. You know, maybe if you're nervous, plan what the first like three or four nights of accommodations just to have some like something concrete in your head. Um, but other than that, just go with the flow. Talk to people. Uh, be open-minded and you'll have the best fucking time. Honestly, I, all of my vacations, I've had a great time. So I'm yeah. sure you have too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I fuck up, but in general, it's, you know, I, I keep coming back for more. So what does that, what does that say? <laughs> yeah. It's either a good time or a good story. One of the two. Hey, I like that. <laughs> cool. All right, dude. Well, yeah, that's all I got. Um, fucking A. I don't really know how to sign off this thing. Cool. That's it. Thanks for watching and listening, people. See That's you in the next great. one. Good to meet you guys. Take care. <laughs> Sweet. That was dope, dude.